It really ain't the place nor time to reel off rhyming diction. But yet we'll write a final rhyme while waiting crucifixion. For we bequeath a parting tip of sound advice for such men who come across in transport ships to polish off the Dutchmen. If you encounter any boars, you really must not loot them. And if you wish to leave these shores, for pity's sake, don't shoot them. Is it stronger they speak, or Vinda? Vinda. Makes a difference if we you know their language, I think. Vinda has very, very little Sangha. Right. Wow, look at this. Is so this... This, is, this is what was... Okay, without these horrible additions. Yes. But, um, and, and all these, these, uh, with the bars and whatnot, they were not, they were not here at the time. They've all been added. But you can see that this is our rail system, our, like our post offices, our rail system, and that's that function. Now, now, your, your, uh, uh, His Excellency Tim Fisher, he, he came out here and immediately looked up and down and said, when's the next train? So, <laughs> I said, I don't know, ask this guy who's coming along with a big clipboard, he might be the station yeah. master or something. So I introduced him, I said, to, to this black man, I said, this is the Deputy Premier of Australia, who was for 20 odd years or something. Oh, pleased to meet you, sir. Yeah, yeah. You he said, well, you can tell me when the next train's coming. <laughs> so he paid to, yeah, he said, ah, yeah. maybe Wednesday. <laughs> anyway, this, this, was, this was Tim Fisher that was here. Charles is done. I never forget that man's pie. Yeah. Hands like a bunch of bananas. Yeah. But a lovely man. He's beautiful old <laughs> station. We haven't been to a train station before. <laughs> so, as I say, all these... <coughs> How did um, Morant and Hancock get to Pretoria on train or train? Not not Morant. Morant wasn't with them at the time. He had gone to Pretoria to attend to what he said to Hunt's Hunt's will. He, because he said that Hunt had left him his polo ponies. Oh. So he wrote to Colonel Hall asking him permission. That was after the capture of Kelly, Commandant Kelly. No, he wasn't Commandant then, he was Shotgun. So Morant was in Pretoria already. But those guys went through this very passageway here. I'll show you now. That Look at the crown. old, um, yeah, I was going to say the old crown. That's the old crown. So this is Edward, Edward VII, Edward Rex. So that's a king's crown. Yeah. So this was also bought. So this to us is also just a little bit of, 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 of heritage. Yeah, brilliant. And interesting to say the next prediction, I don't know when that would have been, but it seems as though this thing, if you'd opened it a little bit, could have slid out for, for and maybe this was to make it open for bigger parcels or something. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I don't know how these things work. But anyway, this is a little bit of British heritage here yeah. in the far north. So you asked where they walked out. Yeah. They came out of here. They came through this portal because this would be would have been the, the access to the to the to the train that was waiting to take them to Pretoria. That's my what I surmise. You think Witten and yeah, uh, those Hancock guys. came Hancock through here? And, yeah, they, they probably walked through. Oh, there's an old steam train. <laughs> no, they are. That's also all the copper and brass is all been stolen. Right. But that please that, 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 that that's just my opinion. Because right. I know that when we used to go to boarding school, we'd all sit on the on the benches out here, and when the train came, we'd all jump up and, and with our tickets. This was the, it used to, the ticket office was here, and then we'd jump onto the train, oh. and this is where we had access to the, the actual train. Nice. No. Oh, well, hello. Hello, sir. Can, 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 I, can I take can I take a photo of the train? Would that yes. help me? Oh, thank you. Yes, of course. So this is um, an old steam train at Louis Trichard station. And Charles has been telling us this is the station that Morant, Hancock and um, Witten came, uh, were sent by train down to be tried in Pretoria. Well, I'm not sure now if um, Morant was with them. Oh, wow. I don't know where Charles has gone. He's a wealth of information, isn't he?
I had a bit of trouble getting the Osmo into <laughs> video mode. I've lost, there's Charles at the front there, you might be able to see. And a few others, they, we, Bev and I were happened to be in, you know, in Scotland at the time. And um, my, my late brother-in-law was the ninth Duke of Athol. His son who lives in Richard is the tenth Duke of Athol. Wow. So the, the, um, and of course, the Athol Highlanders were also in South Africa during the Anglo World War. But anyway, the, um, what was I going to get getting at? This, this issue of Buddha. There was a guy who phoned me once called, called his surname was Keith. Um, I'm sure his surname was Keith. I forget his name now. But anyway, he was from, from, from Ireland. And he contacted me and he said, Do I realize that? Of those two guys who were executed that morning, Whitten obviously wasn't ex ex executed. He he was he was already on the train. Now the railway station, the Pretoria railway station, very close to to the to the old prison. Sure. The old prison is not there anymore, but it's very close. I was a student in Pretoria for a number of years, and I I, I know exactly where this was. And anyway, Whitten says that morning that he heard the volley. While he was he was already on the train. He was entrained to, to Cape Town, though it took him many years to get back to Australia. I don't know how long he was where where he yeah, went to all three, over the three or four years in England. Something like that, yeah. yeah. So so Witten said that that with that volley that he heard, he realized that his two very good friends were no more. And I think he still said something about the pigeons flew out from under the eaves of the rail. I forget what nice words he used there. But anyway, so this this Keith guy, Keith Vaughan, Keith Vaughan, V A U G H N. I'll never forget that guy. Phone me. He said that that don't we know that Morant was never executed? I said you must be joking. <laughs> so he said no, but he's got a photograph of Morant with an Irish, an Irish squad or unit or whatever I said well what regiment no he doesn't know it's just a couple of soldiers together he's got a picture of Morant and I, I bounced this off I think it was Bill Wilmore and and um, and Andy Birmingham I'm talking of overseas guys who were and still are Bill, Bill Wilmore's not alive anymore but Andy Birmingham is alive and in fact I got a mail from him this morning and I bounced this off at him and I said how feasible could this be and I said, no, no, Keith Vaughan is, is he's, a, he's on a different planet. Because, <laughs> because he says, Keith Vaughan says that they were, they, they were, their arms were tied behind their backs, behind the back of the chair. They were seated and they were blindfolded and, and they were executed. And he says, and, and Keith Vaughan said, one of those guys was Tennis Buerta. Morant was already on the train with, with Hancock, with, uh, with uh, Witten, without, without them knowing of each other. Wow. So that was his story. So it was not long after that that Bev and I were in Ireland. We met Keith Vaughan and he said he'd show me that photograph. We had coffee quite close to Trinity College. I think it's called Trinity College, the big yeah, university. Dublin. Yeah. yeah, that's right, in Dublin. And and I said, hey, I can't wait to see that photograph. <laughs> and he showed me this photograph and I said, but we all know that photograph. Uh, it's got nothing to do with, with anybody else. That's that's just one of the photographs of Morant. He, how can you say this is an Irish regiment or unit or... Mm. Whatever. So that was a whole lot of nonsense. Anyway, you got a cup of coffee out of us for nothing. Or it might have even been a warm beer. I don't know. But um, that was Keith Vaughan's contribution to to yeah. some of the myth of Charles, Breaker Rod. Another incident which was brought up. Oh, there's a monument there. Yeah, that's a that's that's a great trek monument. Okay. Uh, it was the attack on the fort where Morant and Hancock were given weapons and they fought to defend the fort and they, there was perhaps grounds to be um, exonerated. Right. No, that, that, that wasn't the fort. That was while they were at Colonel Hall's um, headquarters in Polokwane, in Petersburg. Right. It was it was when Bayers attacked, um, and it wasn't really an attack. He, he, he raided or tried to get into the concentration camp to, to get back a whole lot of, of his men who had who had who had laid down their arms? They were they, they were not joiners. They were guys who, in Afrikaans, Papenierlers. They went and put their rifle down, and they said to whoever accepted them there under a white flag, they they said, 
they're not going to fight anymore. They lay their, their, their rifles down. Right. And they and they, they they literally surrendered, and they, they were with their their women their, their women and children in the concentration camps, and that is where Bayers went in there to relieve them. While some of these men went to the corral, to the to the as we call it a kraal, where there were a whole, whole lot of horses to get fresh mounts, and that is when Morant and Hancock were issued with rifles. Was Whitten issued with a rifle then? I'm not too sure. But there's a picture. I've got one in my book of of, of Morant sort of sitting on his haunches with a 303. Defending Hunt's, Hunt's um, headquarters. I think right. the photograph was probably taken the next day, or maybe the maybe maybe the day before. Maybe they knew that that uh, no. But if they'd known that Bayer was going, going to attack them that night, they would have they would have armed themselves properly. That was probably the next day. This picture was taken of Moran sitting sort of on his squatting with with his rifle in his hand. So I don't see I don't see that as as as. Um, I don't believe he pulled the trigger. I don't believe that that was that warrants his the exoneration um, or, or whatever. What what happened to the film you were telling me about earlier? Was it ever released? You worked on a local film. The movie, yes, it was. It was it was done in three series in in, in Australia. Is it a TV series? TV TV series. What was it called? Do you remember? I cannot remember. They actually okay. sent me a, a, a whatever you call it. A, I'll, I'll have to find it because I've, I've never heard of it. Um, okay. If you have any connection with a guy called called um, I think he's an he's an advocate or whatever. We're actually in the middle of a um, macadamia plantation, as far as the eye can see, are macadamias which Charles was saying the Chinese are now undercutting the price of macadamias, but in the uh, plantation are uh, 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 deer, blessed books and uh, bushbuck, but we've come to see a grave. Wow. So, so this, this originated, or, or this was, let me get in here. Uh, you see now, unfortunately with the wet on the, on the gravestone, it's not very really legible. But anyway, let's start on this side here. Okay. Because these, these gravestones were made in 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 prison or whatever situation in the free state they were made in about and they were they were brought into the into into being in about the 1920s over quite a long period yeah and they were a lot of it is phonetic phonetic spelling mistakes here because some of the guys who they said oh yes but so and so died and so and so died and and they came out and I'll take you to another place like with one of these where they contacted the, this, this department that was responsible. They contacted the landowners and said, we will be there on a certain day to verify whether you've got a, an Anglo-Boer War grave on your property and please have your staff there and anyone else who might help. So this here is Helden van Zuid-Afrika. Zuid-Afrika is written with a Z. Helden is heroes of South Africa. Is that old Dutch? Yes, old Dutch. Fir, V-I-R is, 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 is for Fatherland, Fatherland and Freiheit. 1899 to 1902. Yeah, right. So that that is the Freiheit is free land or something, isn't free, it? Freedom. Freedom. Ah, oh, Freiheit. So there you've got J F. Verkeil, phonetically wrong. Yeah. Spelt phonetically. So that's the wrong spelling. We've corrected it there. I had a lot of dealing with the Bloemfontein Museum. The Bloemfontein Museum was was the the, the sort of the the hub of 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 anything of the Anglo Boer War. Sure. And and they, they've got all the documentation and everything. And then here you've got, got F F J G Putita, that's that's correct. And then Geyser, wrongly spelt, no initial. Another Geyser, also wrongly spelt. Grieling, also wrongly spelt, and then one name that was missing here that we've put on, Putita. Right. So our our 
Oh, let, let me put my, my, re my research when I say that, that I was advised, pointed in the right direction by, by Professor Shangwe, is, is I, I take it as, as accurate. It's not, it's not uh, you know. But anyway, these guys were buried here. And, and why were they buried? Who buried them here? What was the story? So this here is, is, is our, our style of monument, which is not very clever. I thought we were not going to make them flat so that people would use them to put their coffee on or to have a put a piece of, 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 of some food on but it's not very successful we should have made them at a big at a greater angle but anyway we learned by our mistakes and as i said earlier the sotbonsberg skirmishers route which has the the british crown and the slouch hat this, that that is not the australian slouch hat because the boers wore similar things and then those dates are not anglo-boer war but anyway so these guys were summoned to Captain Taylor's office. I will take you there just now, but I'll tell you the story here. And Captain Taylor, he had he had sent a message to 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 Major Robertson, requesting a, a what do they call it, a patrol or a whatever, a group of about six guys. I think Muircherton was one of them, and I forget the names. They they in my book, and they were dispatched to Valdesia, which is a. a, a, a it's a satellite clinic of Elam Hospital. It's just down the road here. It still operates under the name of, of Valdesia, but it's now governmental. So Captain Taylor said they've got to proceed there immediately because there's a group of Boers, armed Boers, who are coming to attack the fort. And um, they, need, they need to, when I say the fort, the, their headquarters, they need to be eliminated. So one of the, one of the guys turned to, to Robertson and said, do we take orders from Captain Taylor? And he said, "Yes, you do." He is the, the commander of this of this area. Now that is that that's already the beginning of of a doubtful command structure. Mm. Here is a, a, a British Army Intelligence Department guy giving orders to Bushveld Carboneers while their commanding officer is standing right there. It doesn't doesn't ring true with me. Mm. But anyway, so these are the so-called men <laughs> who are coming to. To, to, to attack the Bushveld Carboneers. JJ Furkale, 31. JJ Kaiser, 65. He was bedridden from, and, and he had blackwater fever, which is an advanced stage of malaria. Oh, and Val, Valdesia said they can't treat him. He must get to Elam Hospital. That's agonizing. Right. He has, he has FJC, if, if is a C or a G. Portfeder, yeah. Yeah. 18. Who was a young guy, a neighbour of these blokes? Who this man was a wealthy farmer. He had apparently a very a magnificent herd of cows, not very big, but he was taking them to Elam. Elam being neutral, they would look after the cows, and they knew it. So they were, the cows were being driven by this guy who was a neighbour. So he he was 18. He he came along. Then go down here. Here is this man's son of 12 years old. Here is J.C. Kreiling, that, those, those are the correct spellings, 25, we don't know much about him. And here is Van Heerden, who was apparently so impoverished that he, was, he, he didn't have shoes on, he had monkey skins around his, around his feet. Yeah. And he was sitting at Valdesia, and when, they, when he heard that they were going to Elam, he asked if he could go along. I don't know why, possibly that he also needed better medical treatment, than he, I don't know that, but anyway, so that is it. So here is the story. I can't read it upside down. And this is all on the back of your that sheet. I gave you on 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 second July, nineteen oh one. Bushford Carboneers patrol under command of of Major Morrison. Sergeant Major. Sergeant, sorry, Sergeant Major Morrison. Um, confronted. Confronted a group of six Boers, burgers, because these guys were. I I I didn't regard these these blokes die you know not dying but sick with blackwater fever. And, and, and 12 years old, and this guy who had monkey skins around his feet as, 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 as commander. They might have been commando members, but at this stage they were, they were just guys in, in medical, needing, needing medical, who were, who were traveling to Elam Hospital. Their wagon was under white flags. 
Oh, that's what the, the Valdezia guy said, put white flags up. Uh, five, sorry, is this five? Five. Five of them were, were lined alongside their wagon and shot dead. The sixth member, JJ Geyser, was too weakened by fever to alight from the wagon and was shot dead in his bed. The mm. victims were, they're the victims. So later that morning, Captain Taylor arrived here together with Morrison, their commanding officer. No, not Morrison. Uh, well, let's see, Thomas. No, where am I? Am I why, why am I confusing those two names? Commanding officer was, was, was it Morrison or Thomas? I'm suddenly confused with that one. But okay. anyway, the commanding officer of the Bushfield Carbony is at Fort Edward and Captain Taylor arrived here with a few other guys. Captain Taylor got into the wagon and in, under, the, in the, in, uh, under the bed, this little bed in the wagon, was a box of raw gold. Gold, yeah. And in that box were also <coughs> notes. Now, mm. now, those notes were printed in, in Petersburg, then Petersburg, um, nine days or something like that. It was the last printing. It must have been because I, have a, I, have a, I bought a collection, a whole lot of those from a, from, a, from a collector. They were printed nine days before the Brits invaded, invaded um, Petersburg. And that was the last distribution of, of monetary notes. And they were, at that stage, worth nothing. Mm. I mean, it's paper value. But today they, they, they are worth having, which I have a couple of them. And then, that night, back at the fort, Taylor was handing out these notes as souvenirs to the guys. Oh, right, yeah. He handed them out and somebody said, what about the gold? And he said, the gold's have nothing to do with you. Yeah. That, that was Captain Taylor. And, and I believe that this is where the tone was set to a certain degree of ignore white flags, take no prisoners, make it look like a fight. What they, the mistake they made here was they, they threw, apparently they, they put down one or two uh, empty bandoliers and the only firearm that they found was under this old man's bed and it was one of those old single shot Martini Henrys which hadn't been fired for whatever. So of this, this the unlawlessness of the carboneers. That's what I say. This, this is where the wheels fell off. Or, or what caused the wheels to fall off, I believe. And that is, that is, that is again, the, 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 the Morrison school. was never charged? No. Right. No. No. Was he Australian? He, he, he left from here. From here. He, right. he, 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 when, when, when Frank Eland arrived here and when Hunt arrived here, they replaced what they called, uh, Eland wrote a letter to his wife and he said, tomorrow we are replacing the worst of, of a squadron. And who I don't know who the worst were because because Morant and Hancock stayed behind. Right. M was Morrison an Australian? Do we know? Was he English? You know, I'd have to check in in, right. in Bill Wilmore's okay. book for that because I didn't deal very much with these with with their with their origin. You know, I I, okay. I confined myself to what actually happened here. I didn't go into much of of the guys themselves. This is a fantastic tree, isn't it? It is. Now, in my book, is a picture of one of the descendants of these guys standing at this very gate in 1950 something and this little tree this little tree is just a, a little thing that thick wow and somebody that, gave me the botanical name of this here that now it's a magnificent tree and quite uncommon in this area wow now the story here was that that um at that stage it wasn't my my great grandfather who was here he, he he'd already left he died but there was a fundamental guy who'd, who'd taken over the farm during the Anglo war and and these what what happened here was that that the, the Bushfield Carboneers always had a couple of blacks with them, with spades and, and, and uh, pick, picks, whatever. They had dug a trench, they put these guys into a trench, and they put a few stones on here. Now, I know that because when I started my research and I met this Percy Anderson who I was speaking to just now, I said to him, by the way, he said, by the way, you, you'll pardon us because we've thrown those stones. They, he said, there are no stones around here, but they, they, they mess up our, our oh, agricultural man. operation. He yeah. said, we threw a few stones in there. So I said, that's fine, I don't have a problem with that, but some of them I see have, have been taken away. But anyway, so, so they, they apparently dug this trench and um, they buried them. Then, the next day, somebody was passing here and they, they, the staff of, of this Fonamarva, whose house I pointed to and said, that's where my great, 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 great grandmother is. They, they, um, they went down there and they said, the dogs have been digging here. Uh -huh. And their arms sticking out or whatever so it was very shallow so he sent a wagon to go and collect stones and they put stones on here now this this 
they, him and his son, this this guy, yeah. JJ, Khe no, not Khaydin, um, Khaysar, I always get mixed up. Khaysar. Uh, Khaysar, father and son, were exhumed here some years later and they were buried. If you take the old road from Petersburg, Polokwane Pol Pol south, you pass a siding, a little railway siding. The sign is over there that's, that says Khreiling. Uh, no, right. Sorry, not Khreiling. Khaysar. Khaysar. Says Khaysar. And that was on their farm and there's a cemetery there. And one of his one of his his descendants was at school with me and he actually came on tour and he sent me a photograph of their fa their family cemetery. This well I didn't